Why do you love the Great Barrier Reef? Is it for the food it provides? Maybe you see this coral trout hanging out underneath a coral balmy on your favorite reef and think, yum? Or maybe you love the reef for your business. The Great Barrier Reef provides $4 billion and over 33,000 jobs to the Queensland economy and protects Queensland's important coastal infrastructure. Or maybe you love the reef for its beauty. The Great Barrier Reef holds an almost unquantifiable value to Australia and the world as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Personally, this is why I love the reef, the colors, the textures. I love how the reef has both a stillness and a quietness at the same time. But in particular, I love the colors, and that's why I came eight years ago to Australia, so that I could have this beauty in my backyard. But time is running out for reefs. As global temperatures rise, reefs around the world struggle to survive. And we've had multiple mass bleaching events on the Great Barrier Reef recently due to these increasing sea surface temperatures. And if we don't get our carbon trajectory under control, reefs globally are projected to decline close to the mid-century to the late century. So tonight, I want to speak to you on why the Great Barrier Reef is in danger. But I don't only want to talk about problems. I also want to talk about some solutions. In particular, some new coral reef restoration measures that we're looking at at the Australian Institute of Marine Science about 45 minutes outside of Townsville. And in particular, I want to introduce you to some new genetic technologies that we're looking at to increase heat tolerance in corals. So corals are really complex animals that have viruses, bacteria, and tiny little algae living inside of their tissues. And these little algae are really important because they provide the coral animal with most of its food. But the problem arises when water temperatures become too hot, and the corals effectively lose these algae, leaving the coral potentially to starve and die if water temperatures stay too hot for too long. So in 2016 and 2017, we had these hot waters on the Great Barrier Reef, and the Great Barrier Reef underwent catastrophic bleaching. And just like in South Australia this year that had wildfires, we also had wildfires in our oceans. And in March 2020, we had the third catastrophic mass bleaching on the Great Barrier Reef. So in 2019, the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority the body tasked with the care and protection of the Great Barrier Reef said unequivocally that climate change is now the number one threat to the reef. So yes, we do have other threats, including declining water quality, crown of thorns uh, predation, as well as pollution and effects due to ocean acidification. Climate change is number one. And so as ocean temperatures continue to increase, corals will start to struggle and die at higher rates. So we've seen a lot of death in the last couple years, but there is still a lot left to save. And the Great Barrier Reef actually has 3,000 different reefs, totaling roughly the size of Italy. But the problem is, as water temperatures heat up, corals' natural tendency to adapt or acclimatize to these temperatures is starting to outpace, be outpaced by the temperature. So we need to think about new ways that we can potentially accelerate evolution in corals. And one of these ways is called assisted gene flow. And the point is that we want to accelerate evolution in order to anticipate future warming on reefs that we know are coming. So let's take the Queensland coastline, outlined here in gray. And what we have across the Great Barrier Reef is a natural temperature gradient, where reefs up in the far north of the Great Barrier Reef, up by Papua New Guinea, Lockhart River, are naturally warmer than reefs off the coast of Townsville in the central Great Barrier Reef and down in the southern Great Barrier Reef by the Keppel Islands. So what we can do is collect adult corals from these far northern reefs and bring them back down to the Australian Institute of Marine Science to the National Sea Simulator. And then we go to southern reefs and do the same thing. We go and collect those colonies and we bring them back to Ames. And during the annual mass spawning event, which is slated to happen in the next couple days, 
Um, what we do is collect the eggs and the sperm from these colonies, and we mix them in particular combinations to create baby corals that are better able at withstanding high sea surface temperatures. And this is called selective breeding. So this might seem like a really out there idea, but in fact, this is what farmers have done for millennia. They've taken specific traits and they've reprodu reproducibly crossed them in particular combinations to create certain qualities that are desirable. For example, wild corn doesn't look anything like the corn that we buy in Woolies, but due to successive generations of reproductive crossing, farmers are able to get the kind of corn that we've seen day in and day out at Woolies. So at this point, I just want to underscore that this is an acceleration of a process that is already occurring on the reef. We know that genes are moving up and down the reef in particular combinations, but the problem is it's happening too slow for the rate of temperature increase that we're seeing in the oceans these days. So what we're trying to do essentially is accelerate a process that's already occurring naturally on the reef. So the last couple years have been pretty exciting, and we've been able to take the baby corals that we've selectively bred at the National Sea Simulator and put them out on the reef to see how they fare in the wild. And this has all been done under permitting and a lot of strict regulation. Um, but so far, they're doing pretty well out off the coast of Townsville, out on the reefs out there. So assisted gene flow so far, what have we done? Well, so far, we've tested 11 different reefs spanning across over 1,000 kilometers. And when we've tested to see how well these baby corals have fared under increasing temperatures, we've been able to increase their survival by 26 times. So that means when temperatures become hotter, these baby corals are actually better able to survive these high temperatures. But how do we find these resilient parent corals to use in our selective crosses? The Great Barrier Reef is vast, it's massive, how do we find them? Sometimes it can feel a bit like hunting for a needle in a haystack. So, fortunately, nature sometimes follows mathematical formula, and cor re resilient corals look a specific way in the data. So I wanted to see, could I teach a computer to find these resilient corals for us in the data? So I made an algorithm that essentially could find particular reefs that would give us resilient parent corals to make our resilient babies. So what do these reefs look like? Well, they're very hot reefs, so all, all throughout the year, these are corals that are found in warm waters. And they're incredibly variable as well. When you look at their temperature profiles on a day-to-day -day basis, they really do undergo a lot of temperature change. And these are also reefs that have already survived bleaching events. So they've been hit by hot water, but due to their underlying genetic structure, have been able to survive regardless. So. Where are these reefs? Well, in about two weeks' time, I'll be getting on the RV Cape Ferguson, which is sometimes called the Ames Big Blue Boat, and we'll be going up to the far north Queensland to five particular reefs that this algorithm has selected. And we'll be bringing these corals back down to the National Sea Simulator to effectively test how well this algorithm can find these resilient corals to effectively make these baby corals. So this is what one degree temperature increase looks like. This photo was taken off a reef up at Lizard Island, up past Cairns, and we can see on the photo here the corals that have bleached. So they've lost that algae that I mentioned earlier. And the, this photo over here was taken a couple months later, and unfortunately those corals did not regain their algae, and so they've died and have now been overgrown with a different type of filamentous algae. So if this is one degree, and one degree doesn't seem like a lot, but it can be the difference between life and death for a coral. And we know that we have probably another three degrees in our future, either from the carbon that we've already admitted into the atmosphere or the, or the carbon that's slated to go due to business-as-usual strategies. So I really want to underscore that although these genetic technologies look really promising, it will take a combination of the development of these technologies, as well as strong action on climate change and conventional management to help save the Great Barrier Reef. 
So we've talked about what bleaching can do to reefs, and we've talked a little bit about different interventions that we can hopefully deploy to protect them. But one of the ways that I'm trying to save the reef is through these technologies. But it will take all of us to fight for the Great Barrier Reef. So now I want you to think again about the things that you love. Will those things be around for generations to come? If not, please, let's join together and save it.